on behalf of the faculty of the Center for African American Studies, uh, I want to welcome you to our campus and to this wonderful event in celebration of the extraordinary lives of the women of SNCC. I'm Eddie Glaude, I'm chair of the Center for African American Studies, and we're delighted that you've joined us uh, to celebrate this monumental achievement that is Hands on the Freedom Plow. I want to thank uh, the Department of History, uh, the Program in American Studies, and the Program in Gender and Sexuality Studies for co-sponsoring co our conversation tonight. We're excited. In this extraordinary book, Hands on the Freedom Plow, the winner of the 2010 Benjamin L. Hooks Institute National Book Award, and nominated for the 42nd NAACP Image Awards in the category of Outstanding Literary Work Nonfiction. Here, 52 women, northern and southern, young and old, urban and rural, black, white, and Latina, share their courageous personal stories of working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee on the front lines of the Civil Rights Movement. We're blessed to have join us in this afternoon, the editors of this extraordinary volume, as well as one of its, one of its contributors. And I have the privilege to introduce our, my colleague who will introduce them. So I've been charged to introduce our moderate, moderator, Professor Tara Hunter, and she's glaring at me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you better just <laughs> sit down. Uh, Professor Hunter is a scholar of U.S. history with specializations in African Americans, gender, labor, and the South. Uh, she's currently writing what I take to be uh, the most important book on African American marriage published to date. Her first book, To Joy My Freedom, Southern Black Women's Lives and Labors After the Civil War, a tour de force of historical scholarship, received several prizes, including the H.L. Mitchell Award from the Southern Historical Association, the Letitia Brown Memorial Book Prize from the Association of Black Women's Historians, and the Book of the Year Award from the International Labor Asso History Association. She's jointly appointed in the Center for African American Studies and the History Department, and currently serves as the Director of Undergraduate Studies in CAS. And with that last glare, I will sit down <laughs> and introduce to you Professor Tara Hunter. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. You kept it short and painless. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out to support the publication of this really wonderful new book, which is about women involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC. Hands on Freedom Plow, Personal Accounts by Women in SNCC represents an important testimony from women organizers at the very heart of the civil rights movement. Women. Um, constituted the majority of the organizers and participants, which, a fact which is often not um, taken into account in the standard histories and media portrayals of the movement. The book contains firsthand accounts of 52 women who represent a broad cross-section of the movement itself, women who are black, Latina, young, old, southern, and northern. As a historian, I cannot emphasize enough the priceless value of this gift, this gift that they have shared with the world in the form of this book. So today we have four of the six editors of the book and one contributing author who will talk about their stories. And since you all have biographical accounts in the program, I won't um, give you all the details. I'll just give you very brief introductions. And I'll start with the order in which they're going to speak, starting with Judy Richardson, who's going to give also an overview, a more detailed overview of the book. Judy Richardson worked for SNCC from 1963 to 1966 in several places throughout the South. She ran the office for Julian Bond's successful first campaign um, for the Georgia legislature and co-founded Drum and Spear Bookstore in Washington, DC, which was then the country's largest African-American bookstore. She's also a producer of the documentary, of many documentary films, including one you've probably seen part of the series, the PBS series, Eyes on the Prize, which is about the civil rights movement. She will be followed by Dorothy Zellner, who was a staff member of SNCC from 1962 to 1967 and worked in SNCC's communications department 
After 20 years in the South, she returned home to New York City, where she worked at the Center for Constitutional Rights and the City University of New York, CUNY, that is, School of Law. She is a foundation consultant and an activist working to end the Israeli occupation of Palestine. She will be followed by Martha Prescott Norman Noonan. Her name is misspelled, but <laughs> on the tag. Um, she was a field secretary and fundraiser for SNCC while in college. She has taught African American history at several universities. She's been involved in developing and directing an anti-hunger campaign project, a large inner city food buying club, and a supplemental educational program for young people with sickle cell disease, among many other post-movement projects. And then Betty Garman Robinson will speak. She was a chair, chairman, I guess they were called then, <laughs> of the University of California Berkeley Friends of SNCC chapter and a SNCC staff member in several places in the South. She is a lifelong community organizer. Um, she has been very involved in social justice activism around housing and public health issues in Baltimore. She was a lead organizer for the Citizens Planning and Housing Association, among, of course, other organizations. And then last but not least, Dr. Janet Moses joined SNCC and worked in rural Mississippi and Alabama, registering Afri African Americans to vote after she graduated from college in 1962. She also taught secondary school in Tanzania with her husband, Bob Moses, um, for several years. And after returning to the US, she went to medical school and became a pediatrician. So without further ado, I welcome all the panelists to come forward. And I'm getting my stuff together here. Okay. Okay, I'm going to begin. Um, we're going to do, as Dr. Hunter mentioned, we're going to do a, um, I'm going to do a kind of general overview. And then each of us, in turn, will then um, give a sense of how we got into the movement and then um, read some portion from our contribution in this book. Um, first of all, just to notice, um, of the five, of the four editors gathered here, and we are so glad to be um, joined by, by Janet Moses, too, um, of the four editors, there are two missing. So just to know, we also represent um, Jean Smith-Young, another editor, and Faith Holsart, um, uh, the sixth editor. First of all, just to know, we worked on this book for 15 years, okay? 15 years. So for those of you who think, oh my God, it's been the 10th year, thank you, thank you. All right. Um, and I first saw it at Asala, at the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. Um, and a, I was checking into the hotel, somebody came up and had five copies. They had just been to the um, signing that Martha had organized. And I'm looking at this book, and it is the first time I have seen it since we copy edited it, since we went through all the stuff. And it's real. It's a real book. I did not want to give it back to her, OK? <laughs> but what you saw in that was it actually got done. And at many points, we thought the book would not happen. We were afraid we'd going to, we were going to be going to book parties on our walkers. And we were only half kidding, OK? <laughs> um, we didn't know at that point that we'd get a full page glowing review in Essence Magazine, written by Charlene Hunter Gold, or that Dr. Bernice Johnson Reagan, one of our Regan, one of our contributors, would arrange for a full day event at the Smithsonian, that our Washington, D.C. event at Busboys and Poets would be broadcast on C SPAN Book TV, that we'd be nominated for an NAACP Image Award, that we'd get a star review in Library Journal as a must read and that we would be the top-selling book for University of Illinois Press last year, and this is even before we began to get course adoptions. Now, the book, six editors, six African, three African-American, three white, all SNCC women. 
We met in Baltimore four to five times a year. Um, we sent the call out in 1995 um, to, we are all not sure how many, maybe 150, maybe 250 SNCC women. Um, and we sent it out to those women who had been based in the South for a significant amount of time. Did not say what to write. These women chose what they wanted to write about. The royalties are shared among the 52 contributors. And it was not always easy. And I need to say that because you always think, oh, you know, you're in movement and everybody thinks alike. No. Uh -uh. We were SNCC, six strong SNCC women. And we all had various opinions about what this book should be. But we figured it out and we stayed together because we knew these women's stories were too important, particularly to coming generations. And they had to get out into the world. Also, I can say, as, as editors, we were reading these women's stories, and oftentimes, we really realized we did not know each other's stories. Because in SNCC, we just based our assumptions of people and our, um, our estimations of them on the work that they did. Often didn't know their backgrounds, didn't know their grounding. So for a lot of us also, um, it was news. All this was new stuff. Now, I'm just going to read from the first graph, paragraph, in, in this book. Um, the book you are holding in your hands will open the door to a special world. It is a book by women who, now mostly in our 60s and 70s, and let me just say, that used to just say 50s and 60s, but we were on it for so long. You know. okay. Our teachers, organizers, doctors, nursing home workers, singers, farmers, television documentary producers, nurses, homebodies, and professors. But in the 1960s, some of us leaped over the expectations of our families and communities, while others acted out of family and community traditions of social justice, all to become organizers and agitators in the civil rights movement. The very last graph says, though the voices are different, they all tell the same story of women bursting out of constraints, leaving school, leaving their hometowns, meeting new people, talking into the night, laughing, going to jail, being afraid, teaching in freedom schools, working in the field, dancing at the Elks Hall, working the Watts line to relay horror story after horror story, telling the press, telling the story, telling the word, and making a difference in this world. Now, that's just the intro. Now, <laughs> so the so-called master narrative, um, the common assumption about us has us, the women of the movement, as poor little tired, oppressed women. No. We were some strong women. And many were leaders in their own right before they come into SNCC. So you have in here Diane Nash, who is a leader of the national movement and instrumental in continuing the freedom rides. We, many of us talk about Ruby Dar Smith Robinson, comes out of the Atlanta student movement, refuses bail, does 30 days of hard time in Rock Hill, South Carolina. And these were um, community protests mounted to um, desegregate public facilities. And to, of course, as we all were trying to do, break the back of white supremacy. She becomes executive secretary in 1966 on a slate with Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture. You have in here Joyce Ladner, who with her sister Dory, are strong student leaders in the Jackson, Mississippi uh, movement. And they are mentored by legendary leaders of the Mississippi movement, Medgar Evers, Clyde Kennard, and Vernon Dahmer, all of whom, by the way, were essentially assassinated. Joyce is in our book. Movement scholarship, except for some of the newer work on local movements, tended to focus almost exclusively on the men. And even that's very specific to Dr. King and maybe a few of those who worked with him. So you don't even get much about Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who's plowing those grounds in Birmingham before any groups get in there. The scholarship generally hasn't included the incredible local women who were the bulwark of the movement, both as leaders and as troops. And so I would just note the cover of our book. These are all women from the Southwest Georgia movement in a mass meeting. And you'll notice that they're all holding up white pieces of paper. These are papers that they have signed to commit themselves to going to jail the next day. We wanted to provide a way for SNCC women to tell their stories without having to go through anyone else's filter. These stories are not as told to or part of someone else's academic thesis. These stories are the women speaking for themselves. We also did oral histories with a few who we knew would never sit down and write their own stories. 
Many of them are still too busy. As Martha often says, I mean, Gloria Richardson is in here, and she is now, what, close to 90? Yeah, and still working every day. So um, we've got Mrs. Victoria Gray, Annie Pearl Avery, a number of folks who were, we knew they would never sit still. So we did oral histories, had them transcribed, and of course they then um, were edited by Martha and other, uh, other editors. The book also gives the lie to common misconceptions about the movement. One misconception, that everyone was philosophically nonviolent. Mm -mm. <laughs> there, is, <laughs> there is much about self-defense in this book. Um, another misconception, that the movement only happens when an organization like SNCC or SCLC, Dr. King's Southern Leadership Conference, moves into a community. No, often you have strong local organizations before that happens. Another misconception, that it's the younger generation opposing the older generation. No, we're often building on the hard and dangerous work of the older folks who came before us and working with them when we move into a community. So you see a lot of intergenerational support. You see it in Joanne Mance, Joyce Ladner. You see the strength of family and community. You see the level of violence instigated by white terrorists and the kind of state-sponsored terrorism that existed then. I mean, Bull Connor is not just some errant, you know, he just didn't have enough sensitivity training, right? This is a man who is upholding a state-sponsored system of terrorism, okay. But you also see the humor that got us through and held us together. You see in this book what we did as young people in the civil rights movement. Oh, I'm at the very end, good. Okay, um, when we were 16, 17, 18 years old, because we didn't all like, you know, we did not look like this when we were doing this. Okay. Um, the most important message, and I'll end here, is that our hopefully our most important message is to young people. We hope young people will see themselves in us and in our stories and know that they can tackle what's wrong and do something about it now. So let me, that's the overview. It's over to Dottie. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I am a World War II baby. So I was seven years old when the war ended. And I remember blackouts in New York. Um, and uh, as a Jewish person in a Jewish family, um, there was this terrible, ominous feeling of dread uh, hanging over us. And when the war was over um, and the concentration camps were revealed, I remember asking my father, where was everybody? And it turns out that that is the ethical question for all of us is where is everybody? Um, so it's, it's not a surprise, coming from a left-wing Jewish family, that I would end up in the civil rights movement. And it seemed to be predetermined that that would happen. Um, I originally went south in 1960 after the sit-ins, and then came back in 61, and I didn't come home to New York until 1983. Um, if you ask what is Judaism in the least amount of words, as Hillel and other famous rabbis talked about, they said, uh, in fact, they asked one of them to define Judaism while standing on one foot. <laughs> and he said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, all the rest is commentary. Um, so when we were in SNCC, a black-led organization, um, um, never an issue for me. Um, you know, now it's been all turned around somehow. You know, oh, well, how did that feel? It felt absolutely very natural. And when I was scared, it was when I was uh, around white people and not when I was around black people. And when they said, uh-oh, it's a dangerous neighborhood, that meant that's white people, because in the black community, it was not dangerous for us. But black people in SNCC always urged the white people to organize in the white community. And many brave souls, not me, uh, tried. And they were met with unremitting failure. And just when they thought they had established a beachhead, 
uh, their office would be shot into, they would be arrested. It was, then it was impossible. But I have taken that to heart, as, men, as some other people in the civil rights movement had taken it to heart. And now, 40 years later, I'm able to do what SNCC asked us to do, 40 plus years. And um, as an activist in the Jewish community, um, opposing Israeli policies toward Palestinians. Not an easy job, <laughs> may I tell you. And I have been called more names in the past eight years of doing this than I was ever called in the civil rights movement. Um, now, I just want to say something else before I read, is however bad you think it was in the 60s, in the South, it was worse. And this book will tell you some vivid stories that you would never imagine that people would be treated like this. But before I was, when I was preparing for this, I went on the Civil Rights Movement Vets website, which I strongly recommend to all the students, and came across one of my favorite books, which was the US Civil Rights Commission report that they issued every year when the Civil Rights Commission was a Civil Rights Commission. <laughs> and here, just you can't possibly see it, but this is Mississippi, county by county, and how many black people were actually registered to vote in each county. And they did that every year, for several years. I don't know when they stopped. And here is a county that is Let's see, 68% black, Jefferson County. I don't remember what town was in Jefferson County. 68% um, black in the voting age population. You know how many registered to vote? None. Other counties, one. Now think of this one person who was registered to vote and think of what it took not only to be registered, but to actually go and vote on, uh, on, a, on election day. So I, I urge you to look at all of these precious things from the past so that we will know, all know where we came from and what it was like. So I'm going to hurry through my reading. Please give me a heads up. She won't. <laughs> OK, one of the sections that I have starts out like this. I said Foreman was always very keen on history. Now, Foreman, Jim Foreman was our executive director, a person who, as far as I'm concerned, has been, well, hasn't been acknowledged as much as he should be in the pantheon of great people. And he was always very keen on history. And he told us over and over again, I mean, it got very boring. You must keep everything. You have to file everything. You must write it down. You must keep copies, because this is history, capital H. It was always history, capital H. <laughs> and he asked me to write a pamphlet about Danville, Virginia, which I did because it was history. So just to say, especially to the students here, is if somebody comes and takes away your iPad, your iPod, your iPhone, your iMac, what counts is here because they can't take that away from you. And, what, and the way it gets in here is to ask questions of the living, the still living people, and read the books and watch the films, The Great Eyes on the Prize. Um, when Foreman assigned me to write this pamphlet on Danville, he also assigned Danny Lyon, who was a, mm -hmm. a guy from Chicago, 20 years old, who uh, he put to work as a, a photographer. And that was the great thing about Foreman, is that he, he asked what you could do, and there was a place for you to do it. And there was a, uh, the story about me was that when he first met me, he said, hi, can you type? <laughs> this became the archetypal put down of women in the, in the women's movement. But in this case, I was thrilled that I could type. I mean, were they going to send me out into the, into the bushes in Mississippi, where I spent 20 years of my life in the South? And if I even said hello to anybody, they said, where are you from in New York? <laughs> <laughs> So in Danville, I was in a demonstration led by black ministers right near the, the jail where people were being held. 
and we knelt and prayed, whereupon we were hit by high pressure water hoses. And these, let me tell you, were really scary. And even recently, I saw something on one of the television shows about how they can knock your eyes out. I mean, they can blind you, these, uh-oh, I, mm -hmm. have, oh, I have three minutes left? Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so to, uh, to cut to the chase, um, I was very tiny then because I had misdi been misdiagnosed as a diabetic and I didn't eat anything. I was lying, uh, I was on the ground, they turned the water hoses on us, and this big cop came hit me on the head. And I actually, I don't remember his face, but I remember his eyes. And I now think, 40 years later, this was the eyes of a dead man. Mm -hmm. And some of these cops were dead. They were walking, but they were dead people. And it raises a whole question now, which maybe we can get into, is about the role of the police right now and Occupy Wall Street and other places. Um, in any case, Foreman arrived the next day with other people from SNCC, and um, we had another demonstration where we sat on the steps of the courthouse, and we were going to stay all night. And they brought the water cannons again across the street, and they deputized every standing, breathing white man. Another thing that still makes me furious today, that some drunk lying on the street all of a sudden became a deputy and could beat the hell out of you. Um, Foreman decided that, I, that Danny and I should leave, that we were expendable, because it wasn't, it wasn't going to be wise to spend money on our legal defense if we were arrested. So we escaped, and uh, we climbed out of a back window of a church and into a pink Cadillac, yes, a pink Cadillac, <laughs> where we lay on the floor of the back seat covered with newspapers. Out of fear and tension, I began to laugh uncontrollably. A chick, a horrible uh, <laughs> character for Flora. <laughs> At the airport, I switched from laughter to tears, thinking of all the people I had left behind. Danny went up to the airline ticket counter, and in a burst of invention, registered, registered me under a nom de guerre, Joanne Woodward. <laughs> <laughs> And people never fail to laugh when I tell that story, but some people don't know who Joanne Woodward is anymore. So for those of you who don't know, she is an award-winning actress, still alive, married formally to Paul Newman. Along with several other SNCC people, I was indicted under the John Brown Law, which made it um, illegal to incite colored people to acts of war and violence against the white population. Okay, that, that law was still on the books in 1963. Then, along with other SNCC people, um, later on, Bob Zellner, then my husband and I, married and with two children in tow, drove through Virginia many times under, until the statute of limitations was up in the 1970s. We never stopped for anything, not even gas. <laughs> I think that's yours. Or, or, this this might be easier. I think. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I, I'd like to talk very quickly, if I can, about um, sort of what the movement meant to me uh, as a woman, um, as a black person, and uh, finally a, as an activist. Um, when I went south in the summer of 1963, um, I already had been um, doing support work, Friends of SNCC work, um, for the previous year and a half. And so I already had a notion of what it was like to be a woman in the movement. Um, and of course, we all grew up in the 50s and uh, followed Daisy Bates. Uh, shepherding the um, Little Rock Nine, and in in Detroit, Detroit was the location that uh, Rosa Parks chose to come to with her family um, after the Montgomery bus boycott. So she was around in the various movement activities that took place there. But 
For SNCC, the first name that I heard was Ella Baker. And, um, and this, this was from male SNCC workers who t taught me about her vision, her radical democratic vision, uh, both for the society and for organizing. Um, the next person I met uh, was Diane Nash. And uh, she was our speaker at the end of a summer of 1963 of a, a series of events. Um, Bernard Lafayette was the SNCC field secretary who uh, came to Detroit to organize. Uh, Lafayette is a uh, no mean sp uh, speaker himself, but he chose uh, to focus on uh, Diane. And Diane came, she did a series of uh, speaking events and uh, then announced that she had to leave early. And the reason she had to leave early was she was in labor. Mm -hmm. So this said to me, uh, there were no <laughs> limits. <laughs> um, and then the following, I think the following year, we also sponsored uh, the Freedom Singers, one of the first Freedom Singer conference, uh, concerts in Ann Arbor. And I met uh, Bernice Reagan and Rutha Harris. Uh, so I'm always kind of put off when people ask me um, what, what were the attitudes of men in SNCC? Because as a woman, I was looking at the women, and the women were tough. And, you know, my hope was that I could just get on that pathway that they were on. And um, when I went to SNCC, I was not at all disappointed. It was one of the most uh, liberating experiences of my life. I felt in no way restricted, and more so I felt um, encouraged to do things, to, to, to do more than I thought I could do, to step out of my zone of uh, comfort. Um, and I, I see Bob, and it makes me remember that uh, in the... Freedom House in Selma, my ex-husband washed the sheets. <laughs> and Bob used to jump out of the car. You know, this was in the days when they waited on you in the gas station. He would jump out to wash the window so that nobody would wait on him. So I think there were the men that came, came already with some different uh, perspectives. I, I thought that I was coming to work in a Southern Black Freedom Movement. And in the past, I didn't emphasize that so much. I talked about going to work in the Civil Rights Movement. Um, but as I've read the histories and seen how things are portrayed, I think it's just exceptionally important that our children understand, both black and white, what the Southern black community accomplished. Um, the, already, it seems, that one, the, one of the most eye-opening experiences for me as a student was reading about the Emancipation Proclamation and finding out that it didn't free anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, there's the great emancipator, and there are the freed men, passive. And it seems to me that's what's happening with our history. It's, it's very important that this generation and generations to follow understand that black sharecroppers, farmers, and domestic workers change the nature of this country just as black slaves determined national policy uh, in the Civil War and made it possible for Lincoln to win that war. And these things just get lost. They're just, uh, uh, just swept, swept under the rug. Um, so the other thing, as soon as I um, became involved in the movement, and I want to echo what uh, Dottie just said, I understood 
that the words that I had learned to describe race relations in the country were not sufficient. Racial discrimination did not get it. There was so much oppression and so much suffering. Um, when uh, we were at a, um, at our, uh, what do you call it? When we were at orientation in, in, uh, in Sumter County, Georgia, the, there was news that in that county, a young black woman had been, she was four, 14, had been raped by 13 men and, and died as a result. And one of the men, this was such an open act, one of the men was the sunbeam bread man and he had left his truck parked in front the whole oh. time. Another uh, situation I witnessed when I was in Greenwood and uh, finally I went, left the office <laughs> and uh, went out to canvas on a plantation. We spent the day out in these and it looked just like the history books, you know, big white columns and shacks in the back and so forth. At the end of the day, um, I went into uh, a house, a shack really, where a young woman was holding a fretful baby. And she, I, she was my age, I was 18 at the time. And, you know, I was just sort of, oh, how are you? You know, I'm chit-chatting on. I'm so glad we're near the end of the day. And uh, I asked her, oh, you know, um, what's wrong with the baby? Is the baby sick? And she said, well, yes. She said the baby has pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And because it's the fourth time this year that he has pneumonia, my boss man won't allow me to take him to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine that, you know, we did something about it, but I have never forgotten that, that, that young woman sitting there waiting for her child to die. And it reminded me of just what oppression means, has meant in this country and um, throughout the world. Um, I just want to read uh, two more things. And again, uh, the word terror is, is, is the right word. Um, in Alabama, we work through one murder after another, regularly pla passing the locations where people had lost their lives. Reverend James Reed killed in front of the bar near Walker's Cafe where we often ate. Jimmy Lee Jackson, who actually died at the black hospital in the middle of Selma, and they actually washed their clothes at the laundromat, remember, that we washed our clothes at. Um, Jonathan Daniels, out in Hainville, where we went with people to the courthouse. Viola Liutsu, who's from Detroit, on Interstate 80, the highway we used to travel back and forth from Selma to Lowndes or Montgomery. And Sammy Young at a gas station next to the Greyhound Bus Depot in Tuskegee, where we went to relax and party. In fact, when I was regularly going to Selma by bus from Tuskegee, before Sammy was killed, students told me not to even walk on the sidewalk in front of that gas station because the person there had held such a deep hatred for, uh, for black people. Um, we, my uh, ex-husband and I thought uh, after we were married that we would return to the South. And we actually went back to Albany and uh, visited with Charles Sherrod. And I changed my mind when the um, house uh, on the place where they were, uh, <laughs> Was, <laughs> was filled with bullet holes. Um, can I read one paragraph? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, instead, uh, I returned to school and, and he went to medical school. My desire that my children not live in a fearful situation, and we, we had a child by that time and I didn't think we had the right to risk his life. It, by, my desire that my children not live in a fearful situation was not fulfilled. By the time our middle son reached high school age, leaving, living in the Detroit area turned out to be dangerous for everyone, but especially for young black men. Our sons had been harassed and attacked by the police, held up by armed robbers, and present at random shootings. Someone shot into our home, and we all got used to hearing repeated gunfire every weekend. Most difficult has been taking our sons to the funerals of their friends and of the children of our friends, knowing there was no consolation for the slain youth's parents and that racism was the root cause 
of these deaths. Canvassing in black communities in the South, when I was asking, would you like to try to register to vote or to come to such and such meeting, the unspoken questions were, are you ready to lose your job, go to jail, or get beaten up? Oh, you know your house might be bombed, and ultimately you might lose your life. There were people, thousands of them, who actually answered yes to these terms. Mm -hmm. Some of them earning $12 a week or less, some living in homes with walls covered by newspaper to keep out the cold. I don't know where they found that kind of courage. Maybe they were a little bit like me, used to living with fear and aware that being black in America can be so dangerous anyway, that it makes sense to risk everything and enter an even more fearful situation whenever there is some small chance that freedom might be won. Dr. Hunter is just doing such a wonderful job. We told her beforehand, be strict, because we will keep talking. So she's being wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, first of all, SNCC changed me. It changed who I was. It changed who I became. It changed what I chose to do with my life. And chose is a very important word. You choose what you do. Um, and in many ways, um, it gave me new eyes. Uh, I, I saw the world differently. Um, when I came out of SNCC, then I had seen it when I went in. Now, who I was before. I grew up in Tarrytown, New York. How many people here are New Yorkers? Okay, see, New Yorkers think, we, let me just say, Tarrytown is only 45 minutes north of New York City. But see, New Yorkers think that we're upstate because anything north of the IRT is upstate, right? We're 45 minutes north, all right. So I grew up, and that was Washington Irving territory, the author. So I went to Washington Irving Junior High School. I went to Sleepy Hollow High School. Our football team was the Headless Horsemen. Go, Horsemen, go. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what our opposing teams used to do, too. But so, so that, that's what was around me growing up. My, um, we lived under the hill, which is where all the black folks lived, right near the railroad tracks. Um, my father worked in the plant, and that's all we called it. It was the Chevrolet plant um, where the fathers of everyone I knew worked. And you could tell time by the shifts leaving from the plant. Um, my father had helped organize the United Auto Workers, UAW, local at the plant. Um, and then when I was seven, they came and got me out of whatever first or second grade um, because uh, my father had had a heart attack and died on the assembly line. That then forces my mother to become a single parent for me and for my sister. My sister goes to Bennington, I in Vermont, and then I get a full four-year scholarship to Swarthmore College. Now, I say the scholarship thing because it's important to understand what my mother thinks when I tell her that I'm going to leave that, and um, because she had no money, right, um, and that I'm just gonna take off six months uh, to go work with SNCC, which of course becomes three years, but who knew? Now, um, she was amazing though. My mother had an eighth grade education, and what I remember of my mother is these stacks of newspapers piled up in her bedroom. Um, she avidly read the New York Post when it was still a newspaper. And she just, you know, she did, she, she wanted knowledge. We, she made me look at, meet the press. I mean, it was all that stuff, okay. Fast forward, I go to Swarthmore College, uh, good Quaker college, and um, what I find there, though, is an SDS, a Students for a Democratic Society chapter on campus. Now, SDS was the northern progressive support um, that we got from students, primarily white progressive students on the northern campuses. They're working on a number of issues, on campus better conditions for the all-black cafeteria staff, which at that point also included me, by the way, because I'm work-study, so I'm busting tables. Now, you all see, you all bust your own tables. Back then, in these kinds of schools, you had these big, gorgeous tables. And, and waitresses, including me, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, would come and bring you the food, and then they would take the dirty dishes back. OK. But the black cafeteria staff was, you know, we were trying to work for better wages. Um, they were working under really bad conditions at this good Quaker school. And so all of that was part of it. The other thing the SDS chapter was doing, and it was called the Swarthmore Political Action Committee, SPAC. The other thing SPAC was doing was doing tutorials in Chester, Pennsylvania. So, you know, there was that. But the main thing that I come through is they were also helping the Gloria Richardson, who was the strong local leader 
in Cambridge, Maryland, on the eastern shore of Maryland. They were helping her in terms of this local movement that um, uh, was really active and, and really moving through to desegregate facilities because in Cambridge, black people had the vote, but they had no power. Reminds you of some other stuff, right? And so what we were trying to do was at least desegregate the pub public facilities. Now, I get on the bus that SDS has organized on a lark. They say they're going to do this, this uh, bus load of students to Cambridge, Maryland. And I get on not because of any major commitment on my part. It is because my mother is not there to stop me. OK? So don't think that all of us suddenly come in because we're, no. It was not that fervor. It was just like, oh, let me see what I can do. It's when I get there that I realize there is this amazing woman. There are these amazing local folks. And they are changing the world as I know it, along with a local SNCC organizer, um, uh, Reggie Robinson, who had been one of the first staff organizers in SNCC, had gone into Amon County and Macomb in 1961, right? So I see somebody who looks like me. We're, we're getting, and, and I think Betty's going to talk about this, but we're getting $9.64 after taxes if you are lucky enough to get on staff. Right. So you're not in there for the money. So what I see is young people and folks who look like me and my neighbors, and they're changing the world as I know it. And I thought I died and gone to heaven. That's why I decide I'm going to take off three months. OK, now, let me, let me just um, read one piece. And then, um, oh no, I'm not going to do it from here, because I have it in here. That's what I'll do. OK, it's the first piece in mine, and it's called My Enduring Circle of Trust. I should put glasses on, because I can't see otherwise. OK. I leave to go from Swarthmore, I leave to go from Cambridge with Reggie Robinson because he says, oh, why don't you come? We're, I'm going to go visit the national office. And I'd never seen it before, so I said, okay, thinking I'm coming back to Cambridge. Okay. I saw the national office of SNCC for the first time in November, oh, there it comes. Is it coming? <laughs> okay. Uh, in November 1963. It was a teeny rundown office at eight and a half Raymond Street, a one block side street off Hunter, now Martin Luther King Boulevard, near the Atlanta University Center. The office was located on the second floor above a beauty shop. It definitely did not fit my image of a national office. I was 19, had gone to Atlanta with Reggie. Okay. Now, from the downstairs glass door of the national office, I saw this large man at the top of the stairs dressed in overalls and sweeping the stairs. Now, Reggie saw him, too, and then he, Reggie runs up the stairs, and with broad smiles and much hollering, they hugged each other like long-lost brothers. And I thought, whoa, this is truly an egalitarian office, since I assumed the man to be the janitor. It was only after Reggie called the man's name that I realized this was Jim Foreman, SNCC's larger-than-life executive secretary. There was such joy, warmth, and affection in this moment that I thought, Judy, you haven't just joined an organization. You've joined a family. SNCC really is a band of brothers, they later had sisters, and a circle of trust. And I assumed I'd be in it the rest of my life. Now, I later found out that Foreman often swept up, and not so much to clean the perpetually dirty office, which was good since he wasn't all that good at it. Rather, he was showing us that, as he often said, no job was too lowly for anyone and SNCC to do, and every job was important to sustaining the organization. So Reggie introduced us, and through questioning, Foreman found out that I had taken a semester off from Swarthmore, that I could take shorthand, which was kind of like texting but with symbols, <laughs> and that I could type 90 words a minute, which I can almost still do, so can Dottie. Um, so I never made it back to Swarthmore. I become Foreman's secretary which I had no problem with then, had no problem with now, because when I come in, I get a bird's eye view of the entire organization, which is a perfect segue to Betty, because she's going to tell you what that is. <laughs> Hello. I'm through. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Good job, Judy. OK, is this working? So I, I hope she didn't uh, uh, set me up too big, but uh, I'm going to uh, um, I'm going to start with this way. As I've been thinking about how our book has been striking chords with our audiences, today I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into the movement, read a short selection from my piece, and then make a few connections with today. 
So I was born in New York City, uh, grew up in its suburbs. My parents were working class and the first in their uh, families to go to college. I was constantly exposed to racial prejudice and anti-communism in my home, something which was not only disturbing but pretty confusing for a kid. Um, I, had a, I had a Mexican godmother uh, who I never did understand why my mother made her my godmother because she always put her down. She talked about her being a dirty wetback and speaking with broken English. But I loved her as, uh, as girls love their godmothers and their uh, you know, people that are in their community. One of my first boyfriends had a truck driver father, and he was said to be not good enough for me. So again, this is, these are the messages I'm getting from my working class parents. My father grew up on a farm. My mother grew up in a working class uh, family in New York City. So I, I, when I get to college, I'm an average good student, I, student. I go to Skidmore College, which at that point was a women's college in upstate New York. It's now co-ed. Um, I'm quite ordinary. I go off to college. Um, I become involved in student activities. I won't bore you with the details. And I'm part of a network of college students. So I travel to other colleges. And uh, I was specifically involved in the National Student Association, which is now called the US Student Association. There's some interesting stories connected to NSA and the CIA, but <laughs> we won't go into them. Uh, there's a dissertation there for somebody because it hasn't been written yet. Uh, but anyway, so there were young Christian students, the Northern Student Movement, and then later Students for a Democratic Society, all operating on the campuses. Um, we actively discussed political issues. We read about liberation movements around the globe, especially in Africa. And we did some organizing of students on issues like academic freedom, the right to evaluate professors, the loyalty oath for college loans, which was big in the 50s. Um, we held some forums on apartheid in South Africa, uh, the African anti-colonial movements, and segregation in the US South. Now, it, if only, it was only because of these organizations, really, that white students learned about conditions in the South. I don't think we would, this is all pre-sit-ins. We would not have known what the conditions of segregation and oppression were in the South, except for the, the, the organizations that worked to bring this information forward and to sensitize us to this. So um, I'll read you this little piece from the, from, uh, uh, what I did at Skidmore. At Skidmore in February 1960, we watched, and, and this is when the sit-ins began, right? We watched and read the news with great interest. We were shocked to see black college students demonstrating and being beaten for sitting at lunch counters. Students across the country began to demonstrate in support. So, like most colleges, we didn't want to be left out. We didn't want to be thought of as less than the other seven, the seven sisters in New England. Uh, with leaflets titled The Right to Eat and Let Your Voice Be Heard, we invited all Skidmore students to participate in the decision about whether to back the Southern sit-in students. Between 60 and 200 students attended about a half dozen very long heated collective discussions, my first experience with grassroots democracy in action. We discussed, debated, shouted, cried, and finally evolved a plan. On March 22nd, 1960, holding picket signs, 200 Skidmore students, that's, we had 1,200 in the student body, so that's a big chunk of the student body, mm -hmm. left the campus for downtown and marched around the shopping center, the home of Woolworths, which was a big target for the sit-in students in the South. After the march and heated street corner discussions of how to continue, we decided to send four students every hour to, con to continue an informational picket picket at Woolworths. The first students who went were unofficially arrested, and then the fight became one of our own right to demonstrate and our own First Amendment freedoms. Um, the other significant thing we did was we got Nelson Rockefeller, who was then the governor of New York State, to make a public statement in support of the sit-in students. And these, for me, these were pretty powerful lessons about how you really participate in your country and in your democracy. Um, so one of the things that we, anybody who's a student of history will know what I'm talking about here, history deals unexpected hands and times call upon people to act. So I was pretty ordinary, as I already said, but I had had these experiences in my life, uh, the racism of my parents, the, the um, kind of experiences at school where I had been learning, and uh, 
these things propelled me to act, and I was in the right place at the right time. And so, to borrow a phrase from Casey Hayden, who's one of the contributors in our book, I took a step way out there. And um, something I learned back then that applies today to today is that making social change is not magic. I took a step way out there, meaning I left. By then, I, I went to graduate school in California, and I left graduate school and went south in 1964. Okay. Something I learned back then that applies to today is that making social change is not magic. It takes passion, love, and commitment, immense number of person hours, and anybody who's been involved in organizing knows this, and it requires a strong organization. This is on top of putting forward a political perspective and a plan for organizing. Luckily for SNCC, we had both an organizational genius, Jim Foreman, who dedicated himself to building a strong structure, and a visionary, Bob Moses, who was the first SNCC person to go into Mississippi. We started with one staff person in 1960. Staff in the field was paid $9.64 a week. Uh, in addition to the field staff, SNCC had a communications department, a research department, a photography staff. Um, and we had a fundraising staff, and that's basically what I did. And I was going to, I got the seven minute notice, so I was going to read you about the fundraising, but, but I won't do that. But I just want to say a few more things about SNCC and then connect it to today. Um, the field staff started their organizing by overcoming the hesitations people had of fighting back, which were considerable given the conditions that people lived in, even though there was amazing courage. And among other things, Nick ended up building two independent political parties, an organized labor, labor union, and several agricultural co-ops. And that's just, not, that's just even just the tip of the iceberg. By spring 1963, there were 31 field staff in southwest Georgia and Mississippi combined. And during the summer of 1964, SNCC opened freedom schools and community centers across Mississippi, Mississippi and conducted popular education along the, uh, across the state alongside the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party organizing. By fall 1964, the staff approached 200. But how did we raise a budget for all of this? And I was going to uh, talk about that and read you the section from my piece, but you'll have to just get the book and read that part. <laughs> because we weren't, we weren't a 501c3 and we didn't have foundation grants, so we had to raise our money from supporters and because the, also the community supported us. Um, I very much played a support role in SNCC. You won't find stories of any special bravery in my piece in the book, although there are many heroic stories in the book. But what I know about organizing today was kindled back in those days. The ideas and passion of the times live inside of me. Both work on the book and reconnecting with SNCC friends and other organizers across the country meant I revisited the freedom struggle. And in 1997, a few years after we started work on the book, I left a university job in public health research and returned to the world of organizing. I took a $10,000 a year pay cut, too. <laughs> I kept telling my friends and family that a new movement was coming. I knew only that history is cyclical and that doing political education and leadership development, especially among affected communities, was important work for these times. Movements need hundreds of thousands of participants, especially they need conscious organizers to develop the strategy for action, do the research, the messaging, the communication, and organize constituencies. Movements are most powerfully led by the people impacted who can speak their truth to power, and movements need resources and support net net networks. Now, for decades, there's been a lot of organizing under the radar, given the conditions in the country that we're facing now. So in communities of color, in low and moderate income communities across the city, among young people, especially young people who are being deprived of, of any kind of good education, in the LGBT community, in women's, uh, women's circles, there's been a lot of organizing done. Um, and then history has now begun to deal us this unexpected hand. So uh, we saw Tahrir Square. I mean, some of this ha has happened since the book came out. So each time you have to kind of revise your your reflections. So Tahrir Square, I just have a few more sentences. Tahrir Square, um, well, first of all, um, uh, okay, wait a minute, I lost this. Okay. So the racial, religious, and gender class oppressions not only have intensified, uh, not have intensified, because I think they've always been there, but they've been, they've been surfaced 
by the by the Tea Party, by their actions, certainly by the um, the anti-union sentiments that came out in Wisconsin. Uh oh, wait a minute, I lost my page here. There it is. Uh, and uh, the best example, of course, which was the Wisconsin governor. And of course, since we witnessed Tahrir Square and the Wisconsin response to Governor Walk Walker, the Occupy Wall Street movement has become. So times they are changing, and I encourage all of you to find your voice and your place in these times in some kind of work that deals with the conditions and, and changes the world. This is my turn. This is you. So now it's Janet. <laughs> I'm going to talk just very briefly about um, some of the forces that um, sort of catapulted me in the movement. And I've thought about this um, quite a bit. What are the sort of benchmarks in your life that seem to connect you to the place where you are? Can you hear? OK, that seem to connect you. So there, in listening to um, my fellow sisters here, um, I've begun to think, what are some of the key points in um, catapulting me into the movement. And there's one, um, it's not an incident, but a situation in my life that I think um, is, is very, very poignant. I grew up in the Bronx, the Bronx. <laughs> and there's a deep connection between growing up in the Bronx and ending up in um, Mississippi. Uh, my mother happened to be um, from the South. Um, she was a single mother. She happened to be a nurse um, and had gone to um, nursing school when this country would, there were only five schools in this country that trained black women to be registered nurses. Um, one of the things that um, I remember most um, was having to shop on Saturday. And we lived at 166th Street in Franklin Avenue, if anybody knows New York City. And I'd have to walk three blocks to Third Avenue to the AMP store. And this was in the 50s. I was about 10 years old then. And the meat that they sold in the store was always imported from the white middle class neighborhood across the tracks, across the Grand Con. So when it got to our neighborhoods, it often smelled of ammonia, because um, you're looking at decomposing protein. And um, I went with my mother, and she taught me how to smell the meat to make sure that it was <clears throat> OK. When I had to do the shopping myself, she said, Janet, if you don't bring back fresh meat, you're going to have to go back and return the package and talk to the butcher. Hmm. So it happened a couple of times. But it meant that if I got home with meat that was not fresh, I would have to go walk three or four bucks back to the AMP store, ask for the butcher, and tell him that this was not satisfactory. And I think I was about 10, 11 years old. <laughs> so learned early on, <laughs> speaking truth to power. right? And this is something that we had. So my mother was a person who very readily drew lines in the sand about what was permissible vis-a-vis um, -vis us. And this was not permissible. We could not be treated in this way. So I think, and there were a couple of other things. My uncle was um, our favorite uncle. Um, was a conscientious objector during World War II. And he was a hero in our family because he had been jailed when he was in the conscientious objector camp. So I remember I was five years old, and everybody was excited because Uncle Richard was coming home. So, and he was always my hero. And then there was another, my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Newby from the South. And um, I went to a school that was considered an XYZ school. It um, would be one of these failing schools um, today. <laughs> and... Um, she was amazing. Um, what we learned, um, we learned how to read. And I was a very good student. But the most important thing that I think we learned was what an Uncle Tom was. Mm -hmm. right. It's amazing. And I won't go into the details of that story. Mm -hmm. So um, 1962, um, I finished Hunter College. Um, and I was a pretty good student. But there weren't many jobs available for black women. Um, the career office was suggesting that we work in the post office, and there were a couple of other jobs, and I wasn't going to do that. So that's why I majored in anthropology, so that I couldn't work in the post office. <laughs> 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 right. But it turned out 
um, mm -hmm. teaching was about the only job. My mother and sister said, Janet, okay, anthropology, but just take a few education courses. So I did. And after six months beating my head against the wall in New York and being told, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, you know, you're not going to get employed. Um, I ended up teaching at Watley Junior High School, which was in Harlem. And um, I had a wonderful class of kids. It was 813. And so the, the better students were 8182. My class was 813. <laughs> and we managed to, we really survived. I mean, we clicked. I think that was the Bronx thing that um, clicked. But at that particular time, um, there was also a lot of demonstration going on. I think Betty has talked about that. Um, that it was the right time. It was, it was in some ways very easy because there was a lot of fervor and a lot of questioning. Um, so anyway, I left, um, it was the summer of 1962. I decided that I wasn't going to teach anymore. I was going to go south. And there were, horses could not have stopped me from going to Mississippi. So I, I'll just read my piece. It's not very long. Seven minutes. No, no, so, you've got three minutes. I've got three minutes. Yeah. I think I can do this in three minutes. We'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided at 22 that I would risk my life to stay alive, to walk in the sun without shame or guilt for not doing what in my heart I knew I should do. Um, a chain of events had brought me to this crossroads in my decision. Um, it talks, I talk about um, picketing um, Woolworths, and I've also talked about um, working at Wally Junior High School. Um, so I end up in Mississippi, and there's an anecdote that Betty and I, um, I contacted SNCC through Betty, right? And this was in, in Augusta. And I guess it was my accent, because Betty said, we're not taking any more white women into Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our first interaction. This is on the telephone. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so me, for the sake of time, um, let me just talk about the Fayette um, and Annie, Annie Pearl. I think mm, that, that would shorten yeah. it a little bit. That's nice. um, so I worked in Natchez, which is in southwest Mississippi. And um, we got arrested a couple of times. Um, the first time for just handing out leaflets. That was the first time I was arrested and stayed in jail a couple of times. And then one other time, Annie Pearl, um, who's also in the book, was arrested in the group. Initially a bystander, she placed herself in the procession being led into the paddy wagon and so was hauled off with the rest of us. At the jail, the sheriff insisted that Annie Pearl sit down on one of the benches. When she refused a third time, the sheriff, J.T. Smith, started yelling, threatening to shove his foot up her ass if she didn't sit down. Annie Pearl pursed her brow and in a steady voice asked what he thought she would be doing while he was shoving his foot <laughs> into her ass. <laughs> I don't know if Annie Pearl had ever read Claude McKay, If We Must Die, Let It Not Be Like Hogs, mm -hmm. hunted and penned in an inglorious spot. And then I will... Um, paper bag, please. Pardon me? Oh, the, the paper, paper bag. bag. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Paper. Um, yeah. We all have stories that we'd love. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so in Natchez, and then I moved to Fayette, um, which was down the road from Natchez, Mississippi. And um, let's see. Okay. Two male SNCC workers and I moved into Fayette slowly, tapping into a small network of men whose fearless spirits were not bowed by the aroma of Mississippi's strange fruit, which lingered in the psyche of all who were born there, of all who worked, and of most of those who passed through. These men, overalled in dusty boots, <clears throat> were winter trees, deep-rooted, enduring, and unadorned. Their hearts resided in the spirit of spring and sang of renewal and hope. Their tongues spoke widely and often metaphorically in parables of what was important. After weeks of visiting a woman I knew as Miss Crew and her husband, they offered us a place to live. They were raising two grandchildren. One of my jobs was to braid their granddaughter's soft cottony hair, a very uneven exchange in return for biscuits and syrup in the morning and a safe, warm place to lay my head at night. At some point, we were passed on to others, including Mr. Brown and Mr. Pevine. I recall one evening needing a ride back to Natchez. Mr. Pevine offered to give me, to drive me back. We left his house after dark and rattled in his pickup truck through piney woods over unpaid back roads into Natchez. I had lived on my own since I was 21, renting a small apartment just off to Central Park West in New York City. 
My mother had slowly adjusted to the idea of my living on my own. As I moved deeper into the darkness, and I'm sort of skipping, into the darkness and silence of the night, not knowing where I was with a man without whom I really knew very little, I wondered what my mother would say. Um, let's see, go there. One day I met Mr. Brown and his wife. He listened unemotionally as I told him who I was and why I was there. I knew this was not the first news he had about voting. I invited myself back another day, another week to chat some more. He didn't tell me not to return, so I would go back <clears throat> to chat some more. He would ask me if I had talked to so-and-so, and I would dutifully go and talk to so-and-so. After several months, they all agreed singly that registering to vote was a good idea and that they would support a voter registration drive in Fayette. We set the date. I don't remember how the FBI got involved. A rumor had been launched that there would be trouble that a group of Klansmen was planning to stop the demonstration. On the morning of the demonstration, local people began to gather around the courthouse in clusters. Some stood across the street, and others sat at the side of the courthouse lawn. I moved from one group to another, greeting onlookers and those who had indicated that they might try to register. We escorted those ready to take the long walk up the courthouse steps into the registrar's office. I recall that at some point, several white men in a pickup truck drove up in front of the courthouse. I watched them from the courthouse steps as they got out of the truck. Trouble was materializing in front of our eyes. There was no place to go but run. Mother had instilled in my brother and me that we could only be chased if we ran. The bottom line at that moment was that I not show fear. As they approached the stairs, several other white men, FBI, intercepted their approach and escorted them to their truck. Mr. Brown indicated that he wanted to see me. He sat on the stone embankment that bordered the side of the courthouse one among several men with whom we had worked rather closely over the past few months. He wore baggy denim overalls and held a crumpled brown bag in his, head, in, his, in his lap. There may have been another crumpled bag next to him, I'm not sure. Mr. Brown beckoned. I sat down next to him as he instructed and gently asked if he was ready to ascend the courthouse steps. He answered by opening the paper bag in his lap. In it lay a large pistol. I surmised a 38 or 45. Now, Miss Johnette, don't you worry about a thing. You just keep working, he said. I humbly thanked him and managed to escort a few others up the courthouse stairs. <laughs> I don't think, Mr. Brown, I'm getting emotional. Yes, <laughs> Sorry. I don't think Mr. Brown had ever heard of Claude McKay, but like Annie Pearl, he knew what McKay meant. In Mississippi, we live by the grace of God and the love and the vigilance of farmers and day workers who took care of us children, who had no better sense than to believe that we could take white power to the mat. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Powerful stories. So let's open it up for questions from the audience if you want to direct your questions to particular panelists. We're starting with Professor Daphne Brooks. Um, ah, um, thank you all for leading a revolution that changed the world, made it possible for me to be a professor. Oh. And um, I have lots of questions. I'll, I'll limit the time here. Um, and they're different questions. Um, the first is, um, can you all talk to us a little bit about the challenges as well as the rewards of building an interracial coalition of women fighting oppression? Um, what you got out of it personally, and also whatever advice you can give to us now, us today, building interracial coalitions, um, fighting oppression together, the challenges and rewards of um, speaking through difference. Um, and then the other question, um, and I, I want to be really respectful of titles, so Martha Prescott Noonan, I could address you as the honorable or 
a doctor or Mrs. or Ms. But um, you, you mentioned the Snick Freedom Singers and um, the great Bernice Johnson Regan. And I'm interested in how, um, how you all sort of reflect on the place of culture and the movement. Um, so singing, the arts, um, just how that worked for you on a day-to-day -day basis in the movement, um, whether there were songs that you sang to each other or artists yeah. that you saw as iconic that informed how you thought about politics, um, anything like that. So again, thank you and, and just thank you. <laughs> Do we want to go down the um, yeah. yeah. Whoever wants to start first. Yeah. Well, I, I can just say for sure, as soon as you said, who are the artists? I started thinking of Curtis Mayfield mm -hmm. and um, his Keep On Pushing. I thought mm -hmm. he had written that for us. <laughs> right. <laughs> can I just mention, um, and because I want to make sure the students also get um, heard here, but it's funny because for me, I mean, I came out of a primarily, um, in terms of the, the white, the white female coworker and black female coworker, it was fine for me for most of the time. And you'll see in my piece, that's, that's what I'm dealing with. I mean, you know, because we were judging each other on the work. I mean, when young people now say, how do we deal with this? People can't judge you just by, by your words. It really is by what you're doing and how they're interacting and what you're working on together and all that stuff. But I will say that for me, um, after 64, when I'm sitting there in Waveland and I'm looking at a bunch of white people I have never seen before. It's not Penny Patch, it's not Casey Hayden, it's not the white people who were there, some of them, many of them before I got there. It's people who had come down in 64 and who, I don't know. And it's now also changed the balance a lot. And so, um, so when I leave SNCC, in some ways, uh, when I go back to Columbia, I go into really an all, all black world for about the next eight or nine years. So I leave, I go to Columbia, make it for a year and a half. They call me down to Drum and Spear. I'm doing that. I'm doing Drum and Spear Press. I do Black Student Fund. I do Commission for Racial Justice, United Church of Christ. Most of that is primarily black. Now, what I realized working with this group, though, was that I missed out on some stuff. Now, I'm not saying I shouldn't have done it that way, because there was a way. I know that if we were doing Drum and Spear as, a, as an integrated group, it would have been a little different. And we would have had to concern ourselves with, well, we don't want to do anything that's going to you know, upset our friends. We didn't think about that. We thought about what we had to do to build a strong black institution, which was Drum and Spear at that point. However, and I don't know how you balance that, one of the ways some of the black folks balanced it was that they did the black stuff and still had the coalitions with the white people. And that was important too. I didn't have the benefit of that. And what I realized in working with this is you know, as, as Dottie says, my goomba, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I missed out on some of that stuff. But I also got something. I don't know how to, I don't know how to judge it. Well, oh, do you want? I was, I was just going to add some, uh, something about the challenges of, like, again, I think within SNCC, we were, we judged each other on the work. But on the other hand, uh, when people have asked me, well, what are some of the reasons that SNCC split up? One of the reasons was that as white people growing up in the US, we brought a lot of baggage with us. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that we were not conscious of, uh, both in terms of our lack of knowledge, uh, uh, as well as our behaviors. And so to, you couldn't separate that. We, we, there was no uh, conscious process, which I think there are a lot of young white people now who are involved in a conscious process of undoing their racist attitudes, the baggage that they bring with them that is carried not even just by their families, but by the culture and the way that it's established. So I think building coalitions now we, we didn't really think about a building, a, we weren't building a coalition, we were an interracial organization. We had white folks and black folks and Latinos and several Asian, other Asian folks, but we didn't, we were so concentrated on the day-to-day uh, <clears throat> the -day work mm -hmm. and the danger and the voter registration and the reaction to the Klan and the forces of oppression in the South, we didn't, we didn't really think about that inter react, interrelation, but, but, I do believe that one of the problems that surfaced within SNCC was that we as white folks brought this baggage with us. So I think today it would be easier, but I think the white people have to do the, some of the work 
to undo a lot of that, uh, those yeah. attitudes and those behaviors that, that people bring with them. So. Uh, I just want to add that um, one of the themes of this book is uh, what I personally experienced as the worst, probably the worst crisis in my life was having to leave SNCC. So rather than uh, go through that, that's, that's a theme that you'll see in this book. Coming, and a lot of the women don't agree with each other. In fact, there's you know, bitter struggles over what actually happened and who voted when and what, mm -hmm. what, you know, what they were voting on. <laughs> right. um, but I think from uh, my life experience, first of all, we didn't go down to build an interracial coalition. Mm -hmm. That right. was not the purpose. The purpose was to kill segregation. Um, now, some people go in with the purpose of having an interracial coalition. And it, it isn't rooted in the work, like Betty says, it's, it's going to fail. The lesson I have learned is that in order for two different communities to work together, the essential ingredient has to be self-criticism. And if if the, and I'm thinking of the black Jewish coalition, you know, this sort of golden age that supposedly existed, <laughs> that, you know, we hear a lot of, the, there won't be a coalition again until the Jewish community deals with its own racism and until the black community deals with a certain strain of anti-Semitism. So once those things are, once you see that this community is serious in dealing with its problem, then you feel these people may be worth working with. Um, but I, I'm suspicious now of, of coalitions that are just, mm -hmm. you know, built on good and love, you know. It, it has to be, you know, are you willing to go out there and do what is necessary? Um, I just want to, my experience, I think, was a little bit different from most um, people. I really didn't have an interracial experience in SNCC. Um, the projects that I worked on were, um, the staff was overwhelmingly black. Um, and, and it was part of what attracted me, um, having come out of um, what we used to call representing the race, of going to white schools and living in white neighborhoods, um, I was happy um, and was looking um, for that uh, kind of situation. And I'm just saying that, I, I just want to emphasize it because I think there is this kind of general history out there that there was this sort of happy, wonderful interracial civil rights movement and then there was this horrible, horrible, you know, expulsion of whites and mean, angry black people. Um, and, you know, there, there was, for me at least, a lot of um, blackness in the early uh, civil rights movement. And it, it was that we were operating in the heart of the black community, and I think this comes to your next question. The culture of the movement was black. Mm -hmm. The music, the oratory, mm -hmm. the ritual even, of how you would go about, as Janet uh, talks about, going to visit someone. And then realizing, well, okay, they haven't said don't come back. I'm gonna go back again. The, the ritual of working on things slowly, um, you know, going by the first time and saying hi, <laughs> and maybe the third time you talk about why you're there, or they know why you're there and you don't even need to talk about it. So um, I think that, I guess that's what I'm just trying to emphasize, that there's a, a level of blackness in the early civil rights movement that I think is kind of, mush now right. into uh, uh, another picture. Can I just ask though, because within that, you're still, when you come in, you come into Southwest Georgia, which is the only interracial organization before you go into Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But it's existing within this black environment, right? Mm -hmm. But within the SNCC 
group. It is an interracial group, right? Right. Okay. okay. I was there a very brief. Mm -hmm. You know, that was where we were required to go for orientation. Mm -hmm. So that, that so, um, that's, I'm just, you know, again, trying to emphasize that there yeah. mm -hmm. was another kind of experience mm -hmm. that you could have. Now, uh, our friends of SNCC groups were um, overwhelmingly white. Again, because it was a period on college campuses, and I, I just did a thing on this, uh, talking about SDS and the Port Huron Statement. Again, this was a time on college campuses, if you were black, and, and you were trying to go through school. And again, you were representing the race. You know, if you went to University of Michigan and there are 300 black students out of 30,000, you wore nylons and heels to school. You looked professional. You were serious about becoming what it was you were going to become. What we did is a big split from what most black students were doing at that time. I guess I'm next. Um, Identify yourself, please. My name is Takia Hamilton. I'm a third year graduate student here in the history department. Um, I wanted to, first to thank you for not only your, the most importantly, your work in the movement, but also for uh, creating this special, special book. Um, I have uh, just one question. I wanted to, one of the things I noticed in your, um, some of your um, statements here today, and then also in some of the treatments in the book, is this sort of notion of educating, comp education competing with the movement. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more on sort of the, 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 what the significance or the meaning of education um, was among, for instance, your families who thought that you would be giving up something um, and sacrificing uh, your education uh, for your participation in, in the movement. Um, when, when I decide, because Penny Patch, who was white and coming out of Southwest Georgia, she comes back to Swarthmore. And she comes to my room and she says, I understand you've been going to the SDS, the SPAC meetings. Um, think about taking off three months, uh, six months, the next semester, sophomore year, first semester of my sophomore year. And so I think, okay, and how am I going to tell my mother this? Okay. And I go to the hall phone because nobody has cell phones. And I, you know, I call and my mother is amazingly calm. And I say, I've talked to the dean, all's well. I go back to the room. 20 minutes goes by and my older sister calls and she is screaming through the phone. And she says, what do you mean you're taking off? Da -da 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 -da. Okay. Now, um, what happens though is I explain it's only going to be six months and, and, um, and, I, and I really have the commitment that I still have the scholarship. Now, again, I'm coming from the North. Um, I have a mother with an eighth grade education who absolutely believes, believed that both I and my sister would go to college. Um, who understood the value of education because that was the primo thing in the black community. I mean, you will get educated. You will. This is your step forward. You, can, you can't move without this. Um, so there was that. But what happens is that my mother gets pulled in. So um, she's writing these letters to Mrs. Kenny, who was uh, an avid anti-communist, writing letters to the Tarrytown Daily News saying, oh, well, we all know that SNCC is a communist front organization because um, it was said to be so and, and read into the congressional um, record. Now, you can read the dictionary into the congressional record, right? But, okay. So, um, so there was that coming. That was the general sense. And even at Swarthmore's campus, good Quaker school that it was, it absolutely split the campus. When we started doing demonstrations in Cambridge, Maryland, I had this, um, this guy who I thought was amazing. I would look at him in the Russian class, which Saturday at 8 a.m., where there was a professor, can I just say, who was just phoning it in. And so I remember this guy who could say Yanin instead of Lenin, and I thought that was amazing, right? Who had traveled the world. Had I been outside of Tarrytown before? No, I don't think so. So I'm looking at this guy. I overhear him say that the black students on campus who were coming out of Swarthmore into Cambridge, Maryland, that they would, be better they would better serve their people by staying in school and getting an education. This was Swarthmore College. So um, my sister starts working for SNCC, works out of the New York office, 
and starts coordinating the Bel Harry Belafonte concerts the summer of 1964 that he does. He does five concerts for us in Long Island. So you bring your family in, but again, I'm speaking as a Northern person coming um, with same expectations of education, but it means something different for me. What do you think? What do you What do you think your mom thought of education? I mean, to, or oh no, she absolutely knew we had to get a college education. There was no question. But I mean, in terms of the conflict between pursuing an education and the decision to the, to join a movement, I'm just thinking of the first story in the book where she's so talking about her experiences at Spelman and how you oh, know, so the hard. mom, yeah, the mom is just like, "What are you doing? You, you know, um, you're messing up." And so I'm just wondering, what is it that you think the 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 mothers, the families, older generation thinks about what education, the value of education within a context in which you can't actually do much with the education um, when there, you know, these sort of uh, racist structures that are preventing you from even, mm -hmm. uh, you know, capitalizing off but, of that. Mm -hmm. But I think even, even with the restrictions of the time, you were certainly in a better situation with an education than without. And I think my uh, story is very similar to Zahara's in that uh, my parents never got over it. Mm -hmm. um, my mother um, graduated from University of Michigan when she was 17. Mm -hmm. um, my father was an optometrist who lost his sight. My parents sacrificed so that I could go, I got a scholarship to a Quaker prep school. Mm -hmm. My parents, you know, my mother was a music major and a, and a singer. They didn't go to a concert. They didn't go to a movie in order to pay mm -hmm. the additional money. Um, uh, in addition to that, my mother managed a year and a half at University of Michigan Law School and believed that she and the other five black students who uh, were, admitted, were admitted by accident because they all came from predominantly white schools, they didn't use pictures, <laughs> and it took them a year and a half to figure out how to get them out. <laughs> and um, so she moved, my mother moved, my parents lived apart for two years because my mother moved to Michigan so I could be an in-state student so she could pay for my education because that was another way that they kept black students out of college and there weren't scholarships. There weren't things to do. And I came home after the first year of school and said I was going to be an organizer for life and that school was irrelevant. And you were 17, weren't you? <laughs> I was 17. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm amazed <laughs> that I'm still alive. <laughs> and again, I think this is a real conflict mm -hmm. because both things have validity and both things take tremendous time and energy to, to become accomplished in a racist society and it's still racist, is not easy. To become an organizer also um, is not easy. And I think the people who've, who've managed to combine both a professional degree and, uh, and organizing have a level of security. But I think many of our organizers sacrifice tremendously to become uh, activists and are struggling in their old age. I mean, it's, uh, mm -hmm. Hi, um, I'm Christina Henderson. I'm a second year master's student in the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, so I'm actually in a course now called Great Leadership and Historical Perspective. And so we've spent the last 12 wow. weeks sort of delving into some of these leaders in history and sort of what has driven them. And um, we're st now starting to move more and looking at current movements. So Occupy Wall Street and Arab mm -hmm. Spring. And one of the things that has been so interesting in comparing it to the past is that this is what, or the term leaderless movement mm -hmm. um, has sort of come up. And I was just wondering sort of in your experience, you know, in your history as organizers, do you think this idea of a leaderless movement um, is sustainable um, and effective? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> um, well, I mean, first of all, a leaderless movement is 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 not it's not the reality. I mean, leadership leaders that the press makes them into leaders and spokespeople and people who are the become the public face of a movement, that's one thing. But um, uh, in, in the Occupy Wall Street or Occupy Baltimore, which I'm more familiar with, there are a lot of people who are playing leadership roles. There are a lot of people who are doing different things within that context. Now, where it's gonna go, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, and I do think, I mean, a lot of the young people I know have, um, um, they're, they're trying to do things in a much more horizontal way which does on some level release a lot of new energy because if you're being led, then you're sometimes just doing what the leader tells you to do. Now SNCC, I would say, was a very horizontal organization on some level because people in the various uh, projects had uh, to take a lot of initiative, had to figure stuff out. There wasn't uh, a whole lot of like command and control type of thing. So on some level, I mean, the. And SNCC was very successful, and I think it was successful because of that. It released people's energies to to do to rise to their effective level. So the I think the potential is there for something like Occupy Wall Street. Whether it can make a real difference in the problems of the country, it, and I don't think it can in its current form. And what will happen? How will communities of color begin to organize themselves to kind of challenge a lot of the the conditions that that people are facing, I, I don't or not. I shouldn't say begin to organize because people have been organizing. But how will it, how will it, I mean, it, how will it manifest itself to the to the public? I don't know. You know. So I mean, I think it's an exciting time for me. It's an exciting time to be alive, having read a lot about social movements and looked at history and been involved in the civil rights movement or the Black freedom struggle. Um, it's. It's, it's pretty interesting, and I read a lot of the stuff that's going on on the internet about what's up with people of color and why they're not participating, or are they participating, or do people support it or not, and what are some of the, it's, it's kind of fun reading and, and, and also being a supporter, because I do think we need a new social movement, and we need a powerful movement to kind of rectify the, um, the wrongs of our current system. Yes, can you identify yourself, please? I've, well, my name is Jerry Boswell, and I'm, I was active in the 60s while in law school. And I want to follow up on a question, because for those, for many of those that I know that came out of the 60s, one of our concern with the Occupy Wall Street movement really is this idea of the, the nature of leadership and consensus and general assembly that they use. And one of the concerns I have is that there seems to be a lack of understanding of history. I mean, if one looks at SDS and why SDS ran into all the problems it's did and, and how PLP finally was able to take it over, it was PLP because- PLP being progressive labor? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was really because of this question of what constitutes leadership. And what I'd like to hear you all talk about is Ellie Baker, who for me was a person who came out of the old left and who saw that something was happening with students and in opposition or to some degree from the leadership of SC, SLC. Mm -hmm. SCLC. SCLC. She, she was able to say to Martin Luther King, why don't you allow me to bring together a group of students and see what we can do? And there was a real change in the nature of the movement. Mm -hmm. She was both an organizer, but above all else, she was a theoretician. She, under, she understood that there was a difference, and the, the great quote I remember of hers, or to paraphrase it, was when she had the argument with Martin Luther King about the role of the black church and how he said that the movement was to be controlled from the pulpit down to the pew. Mm -hmm. And Ellie Baker said Ella, no. Ella Baker. Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. It comes from the, from the pew to the pulpit. And the, the very nature of how... Well, let, 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 me, let me just interrupt just a second. Well, I'm not, I think your question is, what is the, the role of leadership and... See, part of it is, is, did SNCC have leaders? I mean, that's one question. Certainly, Ms. Baker, because many of us called her Ms. Baker, um, one of the things was that she not only comes out of the left, 
She comes out of the black church. She comes out of the NAACP. She comes out of a lot of black institutions. And when, for example, when Bob goes down in Mississippi and knows about um, Amzie Morris because Ms. Baker has told him about it. The horizontal leadership that we've been talking about, the horizontal, hmm. see, I used to come out thinking, we didn't have leaders in SNCC. Yeah, we had leaders in SNCC, mm -hmm. obviously. The point was that you still felt you could be whatever you wanted to be in SNCC. You could put it, go into roles that you wanted to be in, but there were leaders in SNCC. And they were men, they were women, most of them were black, some of them were white, but they were leaders. Ms. Baker's thing was she did not want to impose her, all of this, what she knew on us as young people. So when she goes to Dr. King at the sit-ins and says, look, um, these young people need to come together, you know, give me some money. She's at that point executive secretary of SCLC, Dr. King's organization, right? However, he gives her the money, she brings all these folks together to her university, a black university, Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. They come in, Julian comes in, he talks about going into this VW bug and, and sh shoving about four or five people from the Atlanta student movement to go up. Diane and the Nashville folk come in. All of those folks come in. But what was interesting about Ms. Baker, with all that she knew, she could sit in a meeting and never impose her view. It was always about questions. Mm -hmm. I remember, I have notes that somebody asked me to transcribe because they were written in shorthand. Nobody could read them except me. Mm -hmm. This was in 1996. And Joanne Grant says to me, can you please transcribe these notes? What you realize is that Ms. Baker's sitting in this meeting. She only interrupts when she thinks you're going down the wrong road. So there's something about a Dick Gregory concert, right? And she says to, to our, our fundraiser at that point, um, the Northern Support Coordinator, she says, well, if we give Dick Gregory money, because he was asking for money to do this volunteer um, concert, um, she says, um, then what precedent is it going to show to everybody else? She tells us the office needs to be open at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's a national office. It needs to be open at 9. And what happens if something goes on in the South, in, in one of our, our, our um, field offices, and the press calls and nobody's there to answer the phones? But she does not do that until she thinks she has to insert herself. She could sit there till 4 o'clock in the morning in a meeting where all of us are sitting there talking endlessly, yeah. smoking forever, because people used to smoke. She had a bronchial <laughs> condition, so she has a mask on and would not say a word unless she thought there was something she needed to say to get you back on the right track. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. She was phenomenal. Um, my personal opinion about leadership in the Occupy movement is that it was an extremely clever move to say they had no leaders. Mm -hmm. That way they prevented the press from lionizing somebody and they prevented the press from digging into somebody's past uh, and having Fox News go to work. <laughs> but do I believe that there are no leaders in Occupy? No. Somebody is deciding how to spend money. Somebody is deciding on the technology. They had unbelievable technology when I went down there. Uh, 40,000 people were not deciding. So there is a horizontal structure. I myself, you know, there are 89 working groups in Occupy New right. York. They all have meetings. Well, most of them have meetings. Uh, they all vote in the General Assembly as a group, but there obviously are people who are playing leadership roles. And I just wanted to correct you. I, Ms. Baker did not come out of the old left. That's what I just said. That's, that, that's factually incorrect. I mean, she was involved in the Har Harlem Renaissance. You don't agree? You think she came out of the old left? It depends I, on what you're going to define as old left. There were black institutions that she comes out of that are her base. Yeah. And she's, that's important. she's progressive. I mean, oh, no, I'm not saying she's not progressive, but oh, no. black folks can be progressive. So I'm just saying <laughs> she's going to be That's all right. Well, I, I'll, 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 I want to say a couple, couple of so things. I'm. Have the last word. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those people who's still very reluctant to use the term leader. And um, it's because of the implications kind of of what you've said. Um, when a, a person from SELC says leader, they mean leadership. And f for me, um, and I certainly think there have been leadership movements. I mean, what I referred to earlier 
as um, slaves when the Civil War starts, um, deciding that they're going to cross the battle lines and present themselves to Union generals was a spontaneous activity. None of the leadership was advocating that at the time. Um, tens of thousands made that decision. And, and the first guy that crossed went up uh, to the Union general and said, you know, I've been building battlements for the Confederacy. So um, I think it can work both ways. You can have farmers in Fayette and Haywood counties in the 50s decide that they're willing to risk everything to register to vote, signaling to civil rights organizations that there's a possibility of, of acting on that in the Deep South. Um, what, and, and this is where I'm so reluctant to use leadership, because I think that we did something different. And in that difference was the way that we related to the communities in which we worked. <clears throat> And so leadership doesn't, I think it, it brings it down because we related on terms of equality. This is unusual. College okay. students, sharecroppers, on terms of equality. And I think uh, Janet's referred to it in her talk. It's in Pratheas. There's this interaction there that's, I think, a phenomenal model for organizing Absolutely. that doesn't involve leadership, but involves joining. Um, and so to me, that's a very important thing um, that, that came out of SNCC, and I think that's why. Um, but then, you know, I'm, I'm also philosophically nonviolent. I know that in these, in these in these categories, but that, I think that's why it, the, the term bothers me. And they know I was very careful um, not to use it until occasionally I was made to use it. <laughs> but um, because I think we did something very special. And the way it's still used today, I mean, people have leadership institutes and so forth. They mean something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I hope we keep working on defining what it was that we did. I agree. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, unfortunately, we can go on and on and on. <laughs> this is such a wonderful event. We want to thank our panelists for their contributions to civil rights, to human rights, to all the things that they've ever done to make this a better country and a better world. And we thank you for the gift, again, of the book. And let's just give them a round of applause. <laughs>